Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to this week's Beaker Browser weekly live stream. We have had a Terra in the background there. Uh, let me know if you have any problems with uh, audio, video, anything like that. So this week going to be uh, talking a little bit about Byzantine fault tolerance and uh, why that doesn't actually have it. Uh, I'm going to just briefly cover what Byzantine fault tolerance is, but I'm mainly going to explain why that doesn't have it and as a result why we don't have any sort of decentralized consensus algorithm, no uh, proof of work or anything like that. And then once that's done, I'm probably going to do a little coding working on the pure sockets, which is my current project. Um, maybe some bug fixing, just depending on um, what work I've got on the uh, queue. As always, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be there uh, watching that, so um, let's get started. Okay, so I made uh, some slides for us here, some whiteboards. Byzantine fault tolerance. What is Byzantine fault tolerance? Byzantine fault tolerance is an idea that you, um, it's basically how to resist problems of trust in the network. So let's say you have a, um, uh, a big uh, decentralized network like DAT or BitTorrent or um, Bitcoin or any of these distributed networks. How do you deal with the possibility that one of the uh, nodes on the network or the network itself is being dishonest with you. So it's basically a broad class of problems, the Byzantine fault, it's a broad class of problems having to do with trust. Now they <clears throat> tend to get broken up into some thought experiments that I'm not gonna get into, but I'm gonna give a link to some really, a really great video that describes these problems. One of the problems is called the two generals problem. It tends to look, you have a graph involved like that. That has to do with whether or not you can trust the network and how to deal with the network that you can't trust and that means specifically by network I mean like the pipes themselves. The other kind of thought uh, experiment that tends to be brought up is the Byzantine generals question which is what do you do when you can't trust um, one of the nodes. For instance this guy right here is lying about what is going on. So those are the two kinds of Byzantine fault tolerance scenarios that tend to be brought up the most. Again, I'm going to put a link in the uh, chat in a second that points you at a really great video explaining it. Um, <clears throat> now, we don't have any kind of decentralized consensus or Byzantine fault tolerance built into that. Um, uh, as a result, there's no proof of work, there's no miners, no crypto puzzles, no proof of stake, any, nothing like that. And every once in a while, this will come up. People will show up and ask, you know, where is that part of the system? How does this work if you don't have Byzantine fault tolerance? Uh, which is a pretty reasonable thing to ask because um, for the past five years, everybody's been talking about blockchains. And one of the most unique things about blockchains is that they solve Byzantine fault tolerance globally. Um, and so, you know, you would think, well, that must be an important part of having the network, especially uh, now. Well. That doesn't have it, <clears throat> and to understand why, you have to understand why you would want Byzantine fault tolerance. Suppose you have a network uh, right here, right? You got all these nodes. Each of these circles is a different computer. You want Byzantine fault tolerance when you're trying to get all of these nodes to behave as if they are just one computer, right? So you have all of the, let's say, Bitcoin network, and they're all pretending to be one logical computer. Um, and in practice, this means it's, it's not an actual computer, it's like a virtual computer. So in Bitcoin, the purpose is to maintain basically a bank, right? Uh, everybody's got their account balances, and you're trying to make sure that this logical computer that contains the entire network works correctly. <clears throat> so when you're trying to do that, there are two conditions that you need to be trying to do that. Let me consult my notes to make sure I articulate this right. Yeah, so you need to be having your entire network trying to act as one logical computer. And then you need strict consistency, which means that if the data of the system got into any kind of a uh, incorrect state um, in a strictly uh, in strict consent, uh, uh, excuse me, strict consi uh, consistency. Wow, I can't speak. Strict consistency. Um, 
if a fault is dangerous, meaning that money would get lost or you have a fighter jet that crashes or something like that, that is why you would need Byzantine fault tolerance. So an example in Bitcoin, a classic example is a double spin. You don't want to have somebody able to spend money twice by telling people different things. So if you, have, if you need strict consistency and you need all the computers to behave as if they are one computer, that's when you need Byzantine fault tolerance. In DAT, we don't do that. In DAT, rather than being this, we're this. Every computer on the DAT network is actually just representing themselves. It equals what it logically is. Um, so for instance, the beakerbrowser.com website is just the beakerbrowser.com website. There's no consensus required. It's not going out there and trying to get all of the file rights made by anybody in the network and bringing them together to build a website. It's basically just the files that I, as the owner of the Beaker site, have published. So since there's no need for consensus with strict consistency, there's no need for Byzantine fault tolerance. So that's why we don't have any kind of proof of work system. As a result, every once in a while somebody will show up and say, hey, what if we put like a cryptocurrency on the DAT network? The answer to that is we just can't because the DAT network is not designed to do that. It's something that we traded. We decided we're not going to have any sort of Byzantine fault tolerance. And as a result, the, the entire network is uh, much more efficient because we don't have to coordinate globally with everybody to make any sort of progress. We can just go ahead and have everybody publishing their own data sets separately, and that's how it works. Now, there are some scenarios in the DAT network where you might not want um, one or the other here. You may not want everybody pretending to be one computer, but you may also not want everybody to be on their own. You might want to have two or three or ten computers all working together to represent one DAT. And that is what the multi-rider is called. Um, and we don't have multi-rider yet. It's something we're working on. But the thing to know is we still don't need Byzantine fault tolerance for multi-rider and DAT. Um, or at least we don't plan to have it. The reason for that is that we are not going to have strict consistency on the multi-rider. It's going to be a kind of scenario where, first of all, you largely trust each other. Um, and if something goes wrong, um, we are only going to be building applications where those conflicts are not a big deal. Um, so again, great for publishing like a website, um, not so good for running a cryptocurrency. So that's why we don't have Byzantine fault tolerance in the DAT network. Um, <laughs> all right, so let me uh, check on the chat here. Um, let me know if you have any questions about any of that. Um, Joshua asks if we could put DATs on a shared blockchain. You could integrate a blockchain into this system if you wanted to. It's definitely a possibility. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a possibility in the sense that you could put anything on a blockchain. We're not going to stop you. Um, but DAT, the DAT network itself is never going to involve uh, Byzantine fault tolerance because that's just not the way that we've um, chosen to design it. Uh, okay. So that's pretty much that. I'm going to go ahead and get into some coding now. I go ahead and grab that link that I was going to share. So I'm putting into the chat a video that explains Byzantine fault tolerance really well. It talks about the two generals problem. It talks about the um, uh, Byzantine generals problem. Those are both kind of the two most popular thought experiments about how to deal with Byzantine fault tolerance. So if you're interested in learning more, go to that video that I linked inside the chat. It's a really good resource. Okay. So, let's get back to work. I have been working lately on the Peer Sockets API. Uh, Peer Sockets, in case you don't know, is a way to um, connect to peers on the network and open up a messaging channel between the peers so that you can build distributed applications inside the browser. And um, so I've been working on this API for a while. It's built on top of the new 
Hyperswarm DHT that we recently uh, announced. And so there's a couple of things that I've been having to do uh, sort of all at the same time. One thing is uh, figure out how the design of this API should work. And the second is uh, figure out the implementation. Um, and of course, that's kind of an ebb and flow. I'm going to try things out in terms of the API design, and then I'll try things out with the implementation and try to make them match up. Um, it's going pretty well so far. Um, I've got some questions about uh, some of the API decisions, especially around streams. Uh, and I tweeted about this recently. If anybody has any opinions about the what WG stream spec, I would be uh, really glad to hear your perspective on that. Um, and I think I've been, been talking to some of the spec authors um, on Twitter, so hopefully they'll give me some insight. But at the current state, this is what it looks like. Um, for instance, whenever you get a um, socket, you can create a read stream uh, and iterate over that read stream to receive the messages that people broadcast. Things like that. So, so far it's going pretty well. Um, what do I got on my to do list? So, one thing I need to do is I need to track how many active tabs there are and leave all the lobbies. Something else I could do is just start knocking out some bugs in Beaker, which might actually be a better idea. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to do that because honestly, the pure socket stuff, it's kind of in a place where I need to sit down. Uh, either I'm figuring out these stream interfaces. Why don't I show a demo real quick just while everybody's here? Yeah, why don't I just demonstrate a little bit about the API. So it comes in a couple of phases. Right now, the design is oriented around this idea of lobbies. And so the idea is um, you can have two kinds of lobbies right now, an open lobby and a site uh, origin specific lobby. So um, an open lobby, um, anybody, any website can join. And you provide the uh, name of the lobby. Um, and so I could be on foo.com, I could be on bar.com. Uh, I can join this lobby, and then I get this lobby object. And then the lobby object is going to um, emit sockets, which I can listen to by listening to the stream. Or I could also just do an old school add event listener. Like that which is, you know, kind of, in my opinion, actually, a better way to do it. I think the socket stream mechanism is fun, but uh, oh, my, uh, I don't know if I, uh, the stream, oh, my hat. Yeah, no, we're in the hat today, Michael. Anyway, for the new connections, I think, actually, listening to the connection event is a little bit more intuitive than using the stream, so we'll go with that. Um, and so, right, so that'll give you connections to anybody else who joined this lobby. And again, it's an open lobby, so you can connect to this from foo.com, bar.com, any website can join an open lobby. And that makes it a pretty interesting possibility to bridge together uh, websites because, uh, for instance, one of the things that came up a lot is whenever somebody would make, um, whenever somebody would make a uh, fork of, like, um, Fritter, for instance, there was some work that people were doing using um, uh, uh, a similar API called DatPeers to discover people, which is a great idea. Like you land on the thing, you open up connections to other people that are on the site, and you say, "Hey, here's my profile, and what's your profile?" And it's a good way to kind of meet people. Um, neat little feature. Uh, but the problem was that it, the DatPeers API, which is similar to the PureSocket API, is constrained only to the site that you're on. And um, one of the things we're trying to encourage people to do is to fork websites so that you could fork um, Fritter and start making changes to it, but you'd still want to be a part of the Fritter network. Um, so a site-specific lobby had a problem there, because if you're on your fork of Fritter and I'm on my fork of Fritter, we can't talk to each other. 
And so the open lobby is a way to solve that. An open lobby lets every version of Fritter and any other application that wants to join in to join the lobby and start connecting to people and exchange information. Um, so whenever you get a connection, you might do something like call this listen function. And then you open up a stream to listen to all the messages. And when a message comes in, we take a look at it. And if it has this type text, we'll say that's a text message. And then we can output um, what that person is saying. And then here's the broadcast function. This is how we send things. So in my little demo app, I just have a, every user um, doing once a second broadcasting hello. Um, and then let me get rid of that silly nonsense. And then every, whenever you do a broadcast, you just go through all the sockets that you're currently connected to and you say, uh, you send your hello message, right? Right there. Um, so this is pretty much a self-contained little demo application of pure sockets. Um, one other, well, I'll, I'll get to this little section right here. Let me just look through your comments real quick. Paul asks if I've seen Substack Stream Handbook and the uh, Dimitri's update. So the Streams API that I'm using is the um, what WG streams. So these are not Node streams. Um, these are the new um, readable stream, writable stream, transform stream APIs that are being used um, in the browsers um, and which are only just beginning to see some use, but you can use them right now, I believe, with the um, Fetch API. So um, since that's going to be the new standard for the web, that's what I'm using. Uh, and actually, my impression of these new streams APIs is pretty positive. Um, there are a couple of things that are a little tricky. Um, and I'm still, I'm, like I said, I'm talking to some of the, the people that worked on the specs to kind of wrap my head around good patterns. Um, but for the most part, I'm actually pretty happy with the new um, W3C, um, or I guess it's actually what WG spec for streams. So um, pretty thumbs up on that. Um, and I mean, I've, I've worked with node streams before, and they've gotten much better, but there was a while where node streams were really confusing. And uh, I think a lot of the lessons from node streams worked their way into the WG streams. So uh, really big thumbs up to everybody that worked on that. And hopefully uh, we will have a good time using these. Uh, so yeah, that's the story there. Eric asks, could you build, or says you can build a multiplayer poker game with this. That's accurate. One thing that's missing right now, but only temporarily, is um, these connections are in the clear. They're not encrypted, they're not authenticated, we're just connecting people whenever they say they want to get in and they can, there's no authenticated information, no cryptography involved in the connections. Um, that's a temporary situation. We're going to be adding, um, I, be, uh, I believe we're going to be using uh, the noise protocol to build in um, uh, authentication and encryption to these connections. And eventually that system will hook into the DAT network um, so that ideally the way this will work will be something like uh, this, here socket that join, let's go with the user lobby. Uh, and that would be a way to connect specifically to my devices. Uh, good seeing you, Duke. Glad you could join us. Um, so, this would still actually operate. I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about this yet, how it's going to operate. There's a lot of variables that I have to answer first. But I'm betting that the sort of user lobby or the owned lobby, the one that's designed to connect to whoever owns that DAT, it's probably going to work the same way. It's still going to be a lobby because uh, as the, um, well, as the owner of the DAT, I can actually have multiple devices. And so somebody that's connecting to me would still potentially get multiple connections over time. Um, so it's a similar overall API shape, I think. Uh, so that's going to be uh, pretty cool when that comes along. And we're just going to sort of um, take our time and iterate on top of the pure socket. But for now, you got the open lobby and then you got the site lobby. And the site lobby right now is, how, is similar to how DAT peers works. It just basically means you will connect to only other people that are on the site that you are currently on. Uh, and I'm sure there's some use cases where that's particularly useful. Okay, so let's take a quick look. See, hopefully I haven't broken any of the code as I've been putzing around with it here. Um, let's find out 
by jumping over to Electron and opening my Pure Socket demo. And I'll create another, and let's see if we get some broadcasts. Now, all right, let's see what I broke. Uh huh. Interesting. Ah, <laughs> that's a good typo. There we go. So um, it's actually a little noisier than it needs to be because I uh, have some broken internal code. Let's go ahead and close that. Now, how am I getting more than one tab to talk to each other? This is actually an interesting challenge because technically um, there's only one um, identity on per computer, and that's kind of a pain. Um, so we've created this mechanism right here, which is a way to basically pretend you're somebody else during debugging, set debug identity. Uh, and so that way I can uh, open up this website and then I can um, take a number, so it'll be debug identity number two, and that way I'm able to sort of pretend to be other users. Um, and that's really helpful um, whenever I'm trying to debug on my local machine, which is a weakness in the current um, version of Dat Peers. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. That's what that code is there. So I set it up in, the, in this demo where I basically look at the query parameters and if the debug parameter is in there, I set the debug identity to whatever that value is. There we go. Yeah, so there you have it. Um, now let me take a look and see if there's anything else worth mentioning about this thing. I think we should go ahead and move on to some bug fixing. If anybody has any questions about pure sockets, feel free to ask, as with everything else. All right. This is a good one to hit. Uh, I just got reported yesterday that uh, opening files from the command line doesn't seem to work right now. Let's find out why. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I just quit Firefox. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> oh, brother. Oh, that's going to be such a pain. You know, Chrome has this uh, ability to um, require that you like hold down command Q to oh, keep from doing what I just did. And uh, that is a good feature. Okay. Well, I'm going to need a half second to uh, get Firefox back online, but while I'm doing that, why don't I get switched over to the Electron 3 branch? And uh, need to get off my npm linked version of Beaker Core real quick. Oh, good. Firefox has updates. While it's taking me a second to get Firefox going again, I'm not going to see your chats. So uh, just FYI. Okay, don't show anything embarrassing for a second. There we go. <laughs> How to completely wreck your MacBook Air. Probably just pegged the CPU and simultaneously doing an NPM install, streaming, and trying to start Firefox. That'll do it. I use a, I want to say 2013 MacBook Air with like four gigs of RAM. That's my primary computer. I've been using it for a while. 
uh, I could pretend that I use a fairly low-end computer to be, uh, you know, sympathetic to other people with low-end computers. We could go with that. But no, the truth is that I just can't afford a higher-end laptop right now. Maybe if I could go back in time, I would have sprung for the slightly better, slightly better laptop. Still, it's pretty shocking how much this thing can do. Okay, I think I'm almost back in the chat. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, oh, recursion. Give me a second to mute the YouTube. There we go. All right. Uh, Moritz asked, is the demo available for the Pure Sockets? Not yet. Uh, the Pure Sockets. Uh, API isn't yet deployed. Um, that demo is specifically for me to test what I'm working on. So that's gonna uh, as soon as uh, as soon as I got Pure Sockets ready to rock, um, I'll bring that up. But not yet. Uh, Eric asked, "Have I tried building Docker environments in my for my development?" No, I have not used Docker. That I don't know if my computer can handle. Uh, Federico says he's still on a 2010 MacBook Pro. Four gigs of RAM, only replace the HD, uh, hard drive with an SSD. It still runs surprisingly well. Yeah, replacing the hard drive is probably the clutch move there. This SSD is just a really big. That's I'm pretty sure that's why my computer has still been as useful as it has been. Is that um, I've got that solid state drive which performs so well. Okay, now I need to test out this usage. Let's get that issue back open. The issue that we're going to try to deal with here is that for some reason Beaker is not opening uh, files that are being uh, specified from the command line. Um, and so let's first try reproducing the command exactly as they did it. Let's get that issue on screen. Okay, here's the issue. And there's the command they're trying. So let's try it ourselves and see how it goes. that this file didn't exist. Let's go to and this will open up the uh, Beaker instance that I have installed, my latest pre-build. Will it? There it goes. And uh, that is correct. It did not respect the command line argument. That's no good. So, the next step is to try to figure out how to get the open command to respect. A different application than I needed to open up my dev build and I don't know the syntax super well for instance can I do dash a and then not give a dot app file do I could I give it um, something else I don't think this is an index.html issue because I think the path I think is probably right. Because if I get the path wrong, look at this, it says that file doesn't exist. So it's resolving the path correctly, it's make, giving it an absolute path. So I think the problem is that the code is ignoring um, the directive. It's not parsing the, the command line um, parameters um, when I do open. I uh, recently changed how this code works for the Electron 3 branch, so it may actually be um, in a good state. But the question i got to ask right now is, I'm passing it as an arg. Yeah, I, gotta, I need to handle the arg. And um, so the first question i got to ask is, how do I get uh, the open command to 
run my dev version. Here is how electron gets spawned. The electron path is. Let's first get this part right. Bin electron. Now that should spawn electron without anything. That's the dev build of or the, the build of electron that's used in my beaker. If I then provide dash dash enable sandbox and then the path of my application, we should see the dev build a beaker open. Yeah, so far so good. Okay. I doubt that I can just pass everything I just did into the dash A. Let's test this by doing, um, first of all, let's just see if I can pass in a command line. Uh, yeah, shebang, bin, sh, echo, hi. OK, so let's see what happens if I do open dash A script.sh index.html. Okay, let's see. Nope. That failed. Let's see, let's see, let's see. <laughs> okay, so it just kind of ignored my dash A. Huh. Okay, let's try this. And the Beaker browser distribution. Oh, do I not have any build? Yeah, I have a build right there, beaker browser dot app. So let's find out what happens if I do that. Failed. Okay, I guess it's not constructing the path correctly. So users call let's try that. Still failing. How do I get Mac OS's open command to play ball with my dev build? I would have thought that this would, <coughs> I would have expected this to work. It's interesting that it doesn't. Is it possible that I can't imagine the quotes are the problem. Oh my gosh, were the quotes the problem? <laughs> the quotes were the problem. That made no sense, but okay. Well, on the plus side, what I can do is I can produce a pre-build and execute, execute against that. So that's what I can do to test this. But before I do that, I need to be sure to build into the code some debugging information. So I need to jump over to the code that handles command line arguments, which is if I go to the app directory inside of the beaker repo, the 
background process.js, scroll down, and it's, let's see, somewhere around here, handle RV. Yeah, right here, okay. So, console.log, arguments are, let's put some stars to make it easy to notice because I got a lot of debug stuff dump into the console these days. Let's make sure that works as expected. Uh, yeah, it could have been the quotes and the escaped um, space were conflicting with each other. I'm not sure. If in bash, how does it work? Every once in a while I get real excited and I'll learn how to do bash and get real good at it and I'll never stick with it. It'd be a really good tool to be really good at bash, but I'm just sort of good at it. Okay, good. Arguments are getting dumped. Stop loading, please. Let's take a quick look at that. Okay, interesting. That's all pretty involved. Stop running, please. I think I was a little too mean to it by closing it right when I was trying to open. Close your file descriptors, please. Thank you. And I'm going to build a distro. Haha, <laughs> let's release the script. So this will take five minutes. Hopefully, not a full five. Mm, while we're waiting for this, um, feel free to you know, ask any questions you got in the chat. Did the Byzantine fault tolerance bit make sense? Is that clear why we don't have it, why we don't need it? There's no shared state that we transact against with uh, strict consistency. That's really the whole story right there. Um, it's just, data is just not designed to do that. And that's a good thing. I mean, strict consistency on a global scale, it's, it's hard to get that efficient. It'd be hard enough without proof of work, but at the moment, nobody knows how to do it without proof of work. And I got problems with proof of work, so I'm not exactly jumping in on that. Uh, eventually, maybe, hopefully, something like proof of stake will start to start to work and We'll be able to have global consensus that's decentralized, but for now, no. So DAT basically segments the network into data spaces where everybody has control um, individually of it. That's what every DAT is. What's POA? Proof of awesomeness? Proof of, I don't know, what's POA? Eric just asked, will peers be able to blacklist malicious sites? Do you mean like um, in the PeerSocket API, Eric? Proof of, Ambivalence? Uh, yeah, so I don't know how, um, Eric's asking how are we going to deal with um, malicious sites that are in the PureSocket API. From the perspective of the PureSocket API, there different, there's no difference between a malicious site and a malicious user, really. It's just somebody who's opened up a socket and is dumping in nonsense. Um, and uh, or sending malicious messages or, or whatever. The first thing that's going to have to happen is um, we're going to need a way to um, authenticate the peers reliably. You need an identity system, first of all. Once an identity system, so that means we need the noise protocol integration onto the um, connection so that you know who you're talking to with cryptographic certainty. Um, but once that's done, we can then introduce connection management tools into the peer socket system. 
um, so that uh, basically um, I can begin to say I don't want to talk to X peer anymore. Now I guess we could probably get that involved early on with just using IP and port pairings or just IPs, uh, but that will have some problems because IPs can be shared sometimes. So you really need, I mean, we, so we might go ahead and let an imperfect version of connection management get in there um, using just ports. It depends on how long it takes for noise to get um, added to the peer sockets. But yeah, eventually we're going to have to have connection management where you can say, this peer, I don't want to talk to that person anymore, ban them. And maybe we'll have to get the, if you're, if you're not, if you're by default being trusting, you might actually have to get the IPs involved because, of course, anybody can generate new um, identities uh, at will. So if you're not being selective about who you connect to in the first place for a banning system to work where you're being trustful at first letting everybody connect and then banning after the fact, we may have to still use the IP addresses to do it. But basically, we're going to have to come up with some kind of suite of um, peer connection uh, management to, to deal with bad behavior. Uh, Federico asks, what's the difference between PeerSocket and HyperSwarm? HyperSwarm is the underlying technology that powers PeerSocket. Uh, PeerSocket will be the web API, um, and PeerSocket will probably actually uh, be not just the, the web API, but also a set of wire protocols, um, so like message formats, message schemas that get used over the network. Um, and... Uh, Yeah, that pretty much covers it, I think. One thing that I've been thinking about um, is adding um, some JSON RPC protocols to the browser as well that maybe I'll show when I, right before I wrap up. Joshua says, POA stands proof of authority. So a specific key has the authority to decide which transactions get in the blocks. Uh, okay, that sounds like... Um, Oh man, is that kind of like what Ripple does, where you're basically setting up trusted nodes that are the ones that run the network, basically? Is that the idea, Joshua? What what um, networks are using POA? Michael asks, what did you end up deciding for the readable, writable part of the PeerSocket API? I'm actually in the process of talking to some of the um, what WG uh, stream spec authors about this right now. Through the magic of, of Twitter, I get connected to them. And um, hopefully, they're going to give me some uh, uh, insight into um, the right call. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading his responses right now. I have to really think about that. There's actually two problems that uh, that you need to solve with this readable, writable question. One of them is just the ergonomics of the API, which I personally find pretty important. Uh, the other is um, the possibility that you might want to actually instantiate more than one stream. Um, and that is more important than you think because um, the streams API requires you to, when the stream is in use, either because you're reading it uh, directly or you're piping it, um, reading or writing it directly. If you're using a stream in the WhatWG stream spec, you have to lock it so that only one code region um, is able to interact, interact with it at once. Um, I haven't read the background as to why they made that decision, but I'm sure there's some pretty good reasons for it. Problem is that that's not always super convenient. It kind of means that um, you can only choose to use, like if you have only one readable and one writable stream on a socket, that means that if you start piping in one place, um, you are not able to use it anywhere else. Maybe that's just a limitation that needs to exist. The reply I just got was that that's complicated because sometimes the underlying um, resources simply can't 
tolerate having multiple stream instances, which could make which makes sense. Um, if there's something that you can only have like one, um, like only one instance of it open, and your create write stream by default opens up an instance, then you've got perhaps a problem. I don't know. I should really think about it. I'm not. I'm not super excited about the readable writable attributes. So I'll keep talking to them about it. Federico asks, uh, says he was reading in the Hyperswarm repos that you can override the bootstraps. Does that mean that you could create a disconnected community? Um, I, so I'm not the author of Hyperswarm, that's Matthias's work, um, which um, is pretty much always the case. Matthias is the protocol lead and I'm the browser lead. Um, so I, I think that, um, I know for certain it's possible to create segregated networks. I think um, if you switch out your bootstraps, I don't know if that automatically means that you're not going to get connected to the same network as some other bootstraps might, because I think if the bootstraps, if let's say you have bootstrap set A and bootstrap set B, if they happen to be already intermeshed with each other, then I think it doesn't matter which bootstraps you talk to, they're all part of one network. So as the consumer of it, I think changing the bootstraps is not going to guarantee that you have a disconnected community. That's the case right now for certain. Now that may change over time because um, one of the challenges of the DHT is providing security of the DHT network. Um, if you were trying to, um, basically the DHT suffer from some similar problems that a distributed network would have um, with um, the ability for somebody to show up and basically create a denial of service attack by flooding the network with um, fake identities and basically misrouting messages. And um, one of the ways to solve that is to create a trust system where the bootstraps are considered trusted and then they delegate out who can participate in the network. It's kind of, I mean, it's obviously a semi-centralizing or a centralizing force. Um, so um, we haven't decided whether or not we're going to do that. But if we were to do that, that would be a case where the bootstraps actually do have the potential, a stronger potential to segment the network and you need to uh, use the same bootstraps as other people because you need to have the trust flowing from the bootstraps. Um, so that's that situation. Our build finished. So let's first make sure that the build does what we need it to. Well, that's a problem. Of course, the open command doesn't route stdio to the command line. <sighs> Brother. And I don't suppose that my debug log captured that output. Because I think I used a separate interface there. I did. Ah, uh, brother. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to rebuild and change that logging to output to the debug log, which totally stinks, because that's going to take a little bit of time. Should have seen that one coming. All right. Got to remember how I use what the interface is for the debug log. One second. Let's see. Yeah, build life, no kidding. There it is, speaker core debug logger. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, brother, except I don't know that the debug logger will be initialized in time. Does anybody know if you can get Mac OS to spit out STDIO? Is it put in some system log somewhere? Looking good. I don't need the crashes. <laughs> this is just one of those things that totally sucks to debug for all the dumbest reasons. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to try the debug logger and just see if it outputs in time. Maybe while I'm uh, waiting for the, if this works, then I'm going to have to run the build again, another good five minutes. I've got these, um, this whiteboard I drew up for the two generals problem. Maybe I'll explain that while we're waiting. Would that be good? Anybody care to hear about the two generals problem? It's one of the classes of Byzantine fault tolerance uh, challenges. Okay, that's a good sign. <laughs> Friend of mine, Paulo, came into town. He says, I'm starting to suspect the comfort food in Texas is actually slang for deep fried, grease soaked. Meat served with tons of bread, lots of butter, and diet soda. That's about right. Let's check that debug log real quick, make sure that that is in there before I run through this whole build again. Yeah, accurate. I certainly feel comforted whenever I have it. Okay. I guess my debug log currently only outputs under certain messages. So where is that definition? Let's see, let's go to the debug logger and 
When does it decide? Oh, shoot. Yeah, the debug logger isn't instantiated in time, so I'm going to have to capture these args. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, here we go. I'm going to do this bar. What were the args? I'm going to go down here and I'm going to capture them right here. I'm going to move this up. Bridges. And I'm going to do this. And then after Beaker 4 sets up, I'm going to log again. Let's find out how that goes. Basically, I have an order of execution problem. The uh, debug logger needs to open up the file for the debug log, and that only happens after the code that reads the argv. So I guess I, this wasn't that complicated. I just could just check process.argv. But anyway. All right, well, this is pretty straightforward. I'm pretty sure that we'll see the arguments in the debug log after on this run. And if it does, I start the build again. So we're almost there. We're almost there. Come on, buddy. Yes. Okay, let's get that build going. All right. And while that build is going, let's talk about the two generals program, uh, problem. All right, so Byzantine fault tolerance. Right here. I have to switch over to my real time video up so I can see what I'm doing here. That guy right there. All right, Byzantine fault tolerance. There are probably a lot of different, let me switch over to my screen while I'm doing this, probably a, uh, a lot of different problems, but the two Byzantine fault tolerance problems that I have heard of the most um, are the two generals problem and the Byzantine generals problem. All right, two generals, Byzantine generals. Both of them are describing different scenarios. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the two generals one first, and then if we still have more time, I'll do the Byzantine generals one. Um, I linked already in the chat. Go back. There's a really good video that explains this, but let's just assume you don't have time for that. So let's take a look at this right here. Okay. This is sort of a protocol, right, between two um, generals on a battlefield. That's our thought, pro our, uh, like, uh, thought experiment here. we got two generals, and they're trying to decide if they should attack, um, and it's important that they attack at the same time. Okay. Otherwise, they could lose the fight. So what they're doing is they're sending couriers to each other with a message saying, I'm ready to attack. Are you ready to attack? And uh, the thing that you want to make sure of is that um, you both choose to go at the same time. If you both don't go, you're going to lose. The problem is that between those dotted lines, you know, you got general number one right here, and you got general number two right here. They're sending the couriers across. So here, courier comes across, courier comes across with their messages. Between these dotted lines is a battlefield, and these couriers can get killed. I mean, the courier doesn't make it with the message. So general number one sends his attack message, and general number two gets it, and he says, okay, yeah, I'm ready to attack. Let's attack. And he sends it over, and you would think, great, 
you've acknowledged the attack, you can go. But the problem is that any one of these couriers could get killed. And so the person that sends this message doesn't actually know if the courier makes it there. So you can never get a reliable acknowledgement of your message. Um, as a result, what could happen is that um, General 1 could say, hey, let's attack, and then General 2 says, yes, attack, but then that courier doesn't make it, so this guy never gets the confirmation. So this general goes into combat and dies, and his whole army is lost. Likewise, um, this general could say, hey, let's attack, that courier gets there, he responds, yes, let's attack. Um, and now he wants to confirm again, okay, I'm going to attack, let's do it, but maybe that confirmation of the confirmation never arrives, and so this guy goes, oh, shoot, I don't know if I can attack, but this guy went into battle and they, they die. So there's, this is basically a statement about networks, where the courier is the, the equivalent of a packet, um, and the network is unreliable, and uh, because of that, there's actually, there's a, apparently there's a proof constructed showing that if you can't trust the network, um, there's no way to come up with a 100% foolproof way to confirm with each other, yes, we're going to attack, let's go. You can keep on adding on more and more confirmations, um, pinging back and forth, but at the end of the day, that bit of information is of the, like, we're both confirmed and in sync is, is never possible. Um, the answer to that, apparently, and I'm really just repeating a lot of the material in that video I liked, the answer to that is to say, well, of course, in a, if you consider the network to be totally untrustworthy, there's simply no answer to this. Um, but usually our networks are not um, totally untrustworthy. They're statistically trustworthy up to a point. And so you basically set a tolerance um, uh, for reliability. And so one solution is rather than sending one packet, you could send, let's say, 100. Um, and if you need, you know, uh, let's say you uh, only expect failures to occur no more than 5% of the time, um, so long as you get five of the messages across um, or receive five messages, you say, okay, that was successful enough. We're going to assume that that, um, that, we're, that we're good. Um, like, uh, so, yeah, you, you basically play against the odds and send a number of messages that you think are going to um, come across given the percentage of packets dropped um, based on your expectations. So that's the two generals problem. And I haven't actually... My, I haven't ever implemented that solution, so I, I can't tell you exactly how that works, but that's, that's apparently what you do. You just model the network as a, um, having some odds of success, and then you send the number of messages um, commiserate with your odds. So let me see. Does that, that sort of make sense? That's the two generals problem there. Still doing our build. Mm, so let's talk about the Byzantine generals problem. Two generals is talking about the, uh, <laughs> yes, it's like Gmail. You never know when your messages are going to get there. All right, so let me get my screen again so I see what I'm doing. Okay. The Byzantine generals problem. Another thought experiment. This time, you're dealing with unreliable nodes as opposed to um, as opposed to an unreliable network. The idea here is you have the general at the top, and then you have two lieutenants uh, um, listening to the general. The general um, is going to say, "Let's attack," and then the lieutenants are supposed to basically tell each other what they heard uh, and confirm the action. And you only want to attack if you hear from the, the general, let's attack, and then you hear from the lieutenant, yeah, the lieutenant, lieutenant, or the general said attack, let's attack, right? So if one of them is lying, this guy right here lies, and he says, actually, I heard the general say retreat, then this guy doesn't have confirmation. He heard attack from the general, but that could be wrong, uh, and then he got retreat from his, the other lieutenant, and so now they're going, okay, wait a minute, I'm confused. Are we attacking or are we retreating? And... Uh, so this guy has effectively ruined the attack. Um, we lost consensus now. Um, and so what you end up doing is having everybody say what they heard from the general. Um, and there's apparently a proof on this one that says that you actually have to, in this hypothetical scenario, you have to have 
at least a third of the um, nodes have to be honest. And if you have disagreement past a third, it's a failed scenario and you don't move forward, the transaction can't be processed. Um, and so you end up with a formula of 3n plus 1 as for how many nodes you need to have in the system to be able to come up with a reasonable amount of certainty that you can move forward um, with a command. Uh, so 3 is actually a bad number. I think you have to have, um, I think 3n plus 1. So um, if you had four nodes, you could handle one attacker, I think. Yeah. Four nodes can handle one attacker, and then I think it's seven nodes can handle two attackers. And it kind of scales up from there. But that particular um, scenario tends to be um, used in uh, things like Paxos and Raft for dealing with Byzantine fault tolerance for a node that's misbehaving. The way that ends up working is you uh, have to have every node communicating with every other node about what command the leader is giving. And uh, if, um, because you have to have consensus of 3n plus, uh, you have to have 3n plus 1 nodes where you're able to tolerate n bad nodes. And you have to have, I believe, n squared communication. So that design style really only scales for the order of like 4 to 10 nodes tops. Um, it's not like a global decentralized or distributed network could never use that that model. Hopefully that's kind of a, you know, give you some kind of sense, like if you hear Byzantine generals or the two generals problem, you at least know what the scenarios are supposed to be and what they're supposed to refer to. But don't, obviously, I, what I just told you is not a great definitive education on these problems. So that's that. Hopefully that you know, is kind of helpful. Kind of interesting. <laughs> Sorry, Wes. Uh, all the videos um, get archived, so you can always go back and, and watch. I also, Wesley, if you scroll back in the chat, I link to a video that explains Byzantine fault tolerance about a billion times better than I just did. A lot of the same material, um, but just um, Actually, the, the guy did a whole, it's part of a whole series on distributed systems, which if the video that I linked is an indicator of the quality of the rest of it, I would recommend giving the whole thing a watch. Eric, that is accurate. So... Eric says, if you ran seven instances of a trusted peer in multiple regions and one gets compromised, you can handle the bad one and restart somewhere else. The other thing is, um, if you have a network of, with the right kind of uh, number of peers, um, a bad attacker, I believe the failure mode means that you just stop progress. So if you had seven instances, you can tolerate up to two uh, malicious nodes or, or poorly acting nodes. The, the difference is actually immaterial. There's no difference between a malicious node and a, and a bad acting node. Um, you can handle up to two and still make forward progress. If you had three or more badly acting nodes in a, in a cluster of seven, it's not like um, if the protocol is constructed correctly, you won't get into a bad state. You just won't make forward progress because the system, all the nodes will not be able to come to an agreement about what to do or how the system is progressing. So that's a pretty key fe feature of um, any sort of distributed consensus um, system is that um, it should never get itself into a bad state. It should always just stop doing stuff um, if, uh, if, um, if an attacker or uh, gets involved or a node um, gets into a, a buggy state. Uh, but again, this is like, that kind of thinking really only applies to um, really data centers where you're using a distributed system. And uh, the Raft protocol is the most commonly used protocol for handling a distributed system with that kind of size of, of, um, of a cluster. When you're talking about something like Bitcoin or any other blockchain, um, some a protocol like that isn't going to work, and so that's when you start to get um, the proof of work 
solution involved. And um, the idea there actually uh, tends to be that it's almost like having a, a leader elected at random based on whoever mines a crypto puzzle effectively. And then um, you uh, just go with the longest chain and the security guarantee in that scenario is based on the fact that um, it would be time and efficient to build a longer chain than the chain that everybody's already agreed on. So time and resource inefficient. So Joshua was saying you can have a randomized set of nodes and rotate it as much as possible to scale it to a larger system if you want to use this for permissionless stuff. Here's my question. How do you agree upon the set of nodes? Um, and if that is a difficult, yeah, problem is randomness because we don't like proof of work. Yeah. Well, in a way, that's sort of what proof of work is doing, right? It's randomly choosing a set of nodes to, to be the leader. Um, but I believe in proof of work, it's just one node that gets chosen in a random set, in which case you don't need um, consensus um, after choosing the random set. Now, one thing we could do um, is um, if you wanted to have a scenario where all this relates to DAT and that DAT internally uses um, hypercore. So let me talk about this a little bit. Internally, you got, well, and uh, Eric just says we need to trust our super peers. Um, right now, there's no super peer trust model in DAT. So that's not necessarily the case or anything we're doing right now. You don't need to trust any super peers in the design of DAT right now. Um, and what you were talking about, well, l let's talk about that though. So suppose, first of all, let's talk about how DAT works. DAT is actually, uh, at its core, sort of a simple system. There is a protocol called Hypercore that is a way of creating logs. And this log is addressed by a public key, and it creates this sequential history of um, changes to its own state. So you got this key, and then every entry uh, along the log is signed by the key, and then we have an addressing system um, that actually is a Merkle tree turned on its side so that we can quickly uh, find and verify individual messages within the log. So on top of that log, you can build lots of different data structures. Logs are very general, um, and um, so in a similar fashion to Git, you basically, on the entries of the log for a data archive, you say, um, like, log entry number one is write index.html to the following value, and then index, uh, log value number two is let's write styles.css and give it a value. And then entry number three is let's write index.js and set it to a certain value. And so it's this, basically, in the case of the dat archive, which is an archive of files, we basically have the sequential list of changes that are occurring to the listing of files. Okay. Now, it's important that this log be sequential. Otherwise, it's you're going to be confused about what the state of the data is, right? So let's say you had two versions of message two. Well, what's the authoritative state of the system? Um, those two different messages could kind of confuse everybody. Um, and so um, that's sort of at the heart of this thing. Rather than trying to, uh, well, basically the way it works now is we just assume there's only one computer and one person in charge of every one of these logs. If you wanted to, you could use that 3n plus 1 form of consensus I was just talking about to set up a bunch, a cluster of computers on the range of maybe 3 to 7 to 10, probably tops, they all are in control of one hypercore, if you wanted to. Now, we haven't written anything that does this, but it's a possibility. And so then what you would be doing is basically setting up these computers. Maybe they'd be in different regions. Maybe they'd be owned by different people. And they would be all coming to consensus about what this log is going to be. And then they would publish this log on the DAT network. And it would be the purpose of that 3n plus 1 cluster to make sure that the log never gets out of this sequential ordering. 
So you could basically do a hybrid of Byzantine fault tolerance on top of the DAT network. Um, so a hybrid of non-tolerant and tolerant systems. We haven't done that yet, but it could be an option if you wanted to perhaps decentralize to some degree ownership of a log by basically having each of these nodes in the cluster um, have shared ownership of the thing. Um, that would be an option. And uh, so that might be a way that you could create um, a sort of a, you know, it's like a semi-decentralized DAT um, in terms of controlling the individual DAT. But I'm not sure yet whether or not something like that would be necessary, so nobody's done it yet, but you could do it. Okay, our thing finished. Let's find out, first of all, well, I guess we can just run that open command and see how it goes. <laughs> what have I been spending like half an hour trying to debug this thing? Normally builds don't take quite this long on my computer, but again, I'm, I'm using so many resources. So. Okay, the arguments are, it's not there. Interesting. It didn't show up in the argv. Okay, follow up question. What happens if I run it again? All right, now let's refresh the log and see. It didn't show up. Septies, I am trying to debug a report that is this right here. Currently, it is not possible to open files from the command line on Mac OS. And I have finally gotten it set up so that I could even see what was getting passed in as the argv to Beaker. And interestingly, I'm not seeing any information show up in the log about the second invocation which is a bad sign for my debugging, I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's a new issue. <sighs> I filed 20 hours ago. Okay, so interesting on two levels. First of all, this, didn't, this should have gotten called because the second instance call should have happened. Oh, gosh. This is going to take me forever to debug. Because um, we basically have two problems here. The first is that the argv at the time of load didn't include this, this index.html. So I could start there. I could start trying to debug that first. The other problem is that Electron has this API for handling a second load of the, the app where it intelligently says, wait, don't do that. Uh, close, the, uh, close the second instance and run this callback right here where I should then be given an, the argv of the second invocation and then I could handle it. Open URL. Okay. So this is interesting right here. I should look at my own comments. In Mac OS it looks like we may be getting the open URL callback instead of the uh, second instance callback. And that's over here. I hate to say it, but I think I have to build the stupid thing again. <laughs> the stream is going to go for years at this rate. I guess I guess I'll just build it again. Let me think, is there anything else I want to instrument before I do this? Nope. Nope, there is not. This is this is the action. Uh, except I want to use my debug. Hmm. 
Here we go. I'm giving it another build. The other URL handler. Federico, what other URL handler? Yeah, so open URL and something. The other something is on Windows and Linux, I think the second instance bit gets called. So this may end up being a platform specific problem. Except that it's not, no? Yeah, well it might be, but I'm on the platform that's having the problem. So let's find out what gets output by open URL here in a moment. And if we don't make any progress, if I don't see what I need to see here, I may just call it a stream. In fact, this probably will be the last thing that I do on the stream. And if I don't, uh, on this build, if I don't solve it, then we may just have to take it off, off the stream and solve it, because definitely one of the reasons the build takes so long is because my computer is starved for CPU cycles right now. Well, while we're waiting for this one to go, has anybody tried any other distributed apps platforms lately that they think is good? Has anybody tried out Solid, maybe, Ethereum, anything else? Any cool ideas we ought to be stealing in Beaker or anything like that? Substrate. What is substrate? CC Shaw is suggesting a situation where you had one DAT that pointed to three to ten other DATs and would only update itself if you could connect to the necessary number of DATs and the values match. Yeah, I don't know. I, the number one rule about distributed systems is to be humble as heck. Because thinking through off the top of your head about any of it is definitely hard. Uh, so something like that sounds like an interesting idea. Worth checking out, but I have no idea um, if there's some, something that would stop that from working. Seems possible. Um, one thing about that is, uh, at least at the moment, there's nothing in it that's designed to give you a 100% certainty about, um, like, uh, 
whether or not what about the freshness of the data. Um, I know that a lot of the protocols tend to use the um, sort of the liveness of the connection with heartbeats and things like that to make sure that you are getting the latest information from the other nodes in the cluster. And if you don't have that, which that is not designed to give you, um, you may not be able to implement um, Byzantine fault tolerance mechanisms on top of that. Uh, so that would be at least one thing that you have to solve and make sure is not a problem on this. So Joshua, you said substrate. What is substrate and what did you think of it? In case anybody is curious, the way that data archives work, they internally use something called hyperdrive. And they're actually comprised of two different hypercores, one of them showing the metadata and the other one including the actual content of the data. Um, so the content hypercore is just basically a sequence of blobs, uh, basically the content of the files chunked up and put on the log. And then the metadata is um, basically the information of a, that you get whenever you stat a file. The file name, the mtime, uh, and then the index into the hypercore. Um, and the reason it's designed like this is that, um, actually I'm sure there are a couple of reasons, but the main one is you don't want to download the content of the files when you download the metadata. And so by putting them on different hypercores, you get a level of indirection so that you only act, you only download the files whenever you actually want to on demand. So there are in fact two hypercores to every data archive. So Joshua says that Substrate is a platform slash library to build your own chains. It says it's apparently maybe a secret. It's going to be released later this month. Do you work on it, Joshua, or what is your, um, yeah? Curious, uh, what's your take? Uh, CC Shaw says Mastodon is pretty cool. Likes the federated feed feature. Yeah, I tried out Mastodon. I thought it was pretty cool. It's definitely, um, it's cool to see um, federation actually seem to get traction. People have tried it multiple times and it just never seems to quite catch on. This one's pretty uh pretty neat to see it happening and it's kind of the way I feel about Mastodon is that I think on a technical level I don't get excited about it um, I think that um, I, I think that the opportunities with distributed systems are, are much more interesting right now um, and potentially could speed up the development of more um, decentralized applications so that you know because Mastodon has taken a, a whole lot of work to get going um, and uh, it would be really great if applications like Mastodon could be get built without it being a big deal. Uh, it would be awesome if decentralized applications were as easy to build as a current HTTP-based web application. And so um, that's the way I kind of feel about Mastodon is it's, it's almost like um, I'm glad that we have it as a, a fail-safe. Or, a, a, yeah, fail-safe. If things go wrong, none of the other projects pan out, at least Mastodon is out there um, doing what it does, so that's pretty great. Uh, Eric asks if I saw Andre's video, uh, his talk, uh, Reinventing the Social Web, um, which he gave at Full Stack Fest. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I've heard good things. People have mentioned that they really liked it. And um, so I, I recommend anybody check it out. I used to work on um, Secure Skull, but I think most people know this. Um, I worked on it originally. I was the second 
a contributor to it and have since moved on to the DAT and Beaker stack, but I have a lot of love for, for Secure Skull, but I love what they're doing, and um, Andre's doing some pretty great stuff, um, bringing uh, Secure Skull about to mobile right now. Build finished, let's see what happened. Did open URL get called? That's the question. is not looking good. Oh boy. Yeah, it's not getting called. I guess my last ditch, I'm gonna have to jump into Electron. First of all, see if anybody's reported this, and uh, second of all, uh, make sure I'm using the APIs right. Bummer. Joshua says that um, Substrate is his company, so I hope that goes well, Josh. I don't think I need args in the open command because index.html is the argument that should be getting passed. I'm pretty sure. Like that's the target of open and the dash a to the beaker application is just saying which application to use. So I ought to be getting that information somewhere. So let's check the issues board on Electron, see if somebody else has run into this. Eric says we need characters on Silicon Valley to use Beaker. That is the truth. When are we going to get that free HBO publicity? That's, that's what we really need. Uh, not seeing. Not seeing anything here. Possible that there is another command for files, open file. <laughs> well, now we're on to something, aren't we? I think what's happening is that rather than open URL, we're getting open file, which makes sense because it's a file we're trying to open. I bet you money, in fact, that if I jump over here and do That works. Yeah, it's another event. Progress. OK. Uh, Joshua, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but let's first add the open file command, which honestly ought to work pretty much the same way here. So let's check the documentation real quick. It's, do we need to, yeah, we call it prevent default. Use the mode when it's already open. Once to reuse, open file is also made when the file is dropped on the dock and the application is not running. Good to know. Make sure to listen very early. Okay, before ready, that's good. That's all fine. It's a path. I'm guessing that I need to prepend.
protocol to it. All right, fingers crossed. We got one last build, and then we will have solved this. Sweet. Michael just asked, so if that's Mac OS specific, what do you do for the other operating systems? That, I believe, should be the second instance scenario. I think that's what happens, is that the um, operating system tries to open another instance of the application, and then it gets passed into the argv, which means that actually we're only looking right now for URLs. We're not looking for files. So maybe to, to help with that, we also need to include a starts with a slash. Of course, uh, on Windows, yeah, how do, I'm going to need a, 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 a good rule for detecting Windows and Linux, whether or not something looks like a path, which I guess I could just look for the path delimiter inside of the string. But that's clunky as heck. I may need to, I may need to jump over to... Uh, Oh, my VMs to debug that and basically do what I'm doing now, cut new releases and, and uh, log what gets spit out. Maybe I could look around and see if somebody else has solved it, but yeah, I'll have to have FS a to-do to make sure that this works on Windows and Linux. Or we could just tell everybody else on Windows and Linux that they ought to be using the cooler operating system and not worry about it. That's just between us. Uh, okay, uh, free Kekistan. <laughs> uh, is asking how to get integrated into the Fritter network. Uh, Fritter is a proof of concept, and the answer is that you have to get followed by other people, and Fritter does not make that easy yet. Um, that is a tooling question that um, is going to basically improve over time, but right now it kind of sucks. So for now, um, my building. For now, uh, I would just sort of say Fritter is kind of hardcore. You have to share your Fritter URL manually with other people um, that you already know, so you don't. It's not super easy to get hooked in. So but that's because Fritter is a proof of concept, which is great, by the way. It really helped us learn a bit about what it's like to build applications on the stack. We're going to take everything we learned and build out a better tool set, um, which is. I've actually got some of that code written already. It's going to be a protocol called Citizen. It should be pretty sweet. But for now, that's the answer. All right, Joshua, let me answer your question. You asked, uh, any, has anybody from the Web3 Summit gotten in touch? Um, no, not yet. I, yeah, I've talked a little bit to folks like in the Ethereum Web3 sphere, um, but not, um, not about the Web3 Summit. So nobody's gotten in touch yet. Um, happy to, you know, talk and, and see if uh, something like that can fit into the schedule. Joshua says, I guess I don't have enough clout yet to get us into the Web3 Summit. You and me both.
The suspense is killing me. I bet this is a really exciting moment to come into the live stream. Hey, I'll check out that weekly live stream. Oh, it's just sitting there. <laughs> uh, that's a good one Michael uh, Michael asks do, uh, do you have to worry about back pressure in the pure socket API and if so would you refer to it as pure pressure if I have to create an API for back pressure in pure sockets I will definitely call it pure pressure but at the moment it looks like um, the way that will actually work out uh, should be fine um, basically uh, the socket.write method will return a promise and you just wait for that promise um, to complete and you know that you have the you know sort of the capacity to send another message and then in the the writable streams have a similar mechanism for for back pressure that is more more or less the same thing it's you, it's it will tell you um, through the um, either by awaiting the, the right streams, right method, or um, there's also this um, promise returning method called, I think, ready on the right stream interface that, yeah, so it's a lot of waiting for promises. And that's how back pressure will work. Um, so, yeah. I really hope, though, that I have to create some kind of interface for it now. I didn't want to before, but now I definitely want to. Yeah, I'm really excited to get um, Pure Socket in there. Oh yeah, you know what I could talk about is I'm working on this interface for JSON RPC. One thing I was thinking was it would be really cool if the browser included an interface like this, where you could pass in one of the Pure Sockets and instantiate a JSON RPC server. As simply as this, you just pass in the socket and then you pass in an API definition and there you go and then on the client side you create a client you pass in the socket and then you just call you just call try out methods doesn't matter if you you don't have to know if the method really exists and it uses a proxy object and I've got most of this implemented already it uses a proxy object translates it to JSON RPC tries to make the call on the other end if it works great get the response back and if the other end doesn't have a, that method implemented it throws a not found It'd be really nice to have sort of this built-in mechanism for uh, exporting and importing APIs on top of pure sockets. So that's one thing I've been thinking about for the stack. Another thing I've been thinking about is it'd be really great to have a generic socket interface between the applications. I know there are a couple of mechanisms like that already in the browser, things like the post message between tabs and stuff like that, but I don't know how good it is. So it'd be really sweet to have an interface that works just like pure socket, but it's maybe like local socket. And that way you could export interfaces between applications locally. 
and then you could use this JSON RPC, and now you got this unified sockets and, and RPCs. Something else I've been thinking about is, it'd be really great if you could do this. Um, basically expose replication as a web API on the dead archive, and then you could replicate archives through the pure sockets. So this would basically be a way to create new channels for replicating dat data. That would be pretty sweet, I think. And then, eventually, we're going to expose hypercore, possibly something called dat core, I have no idea how these will get addressed. And then a uh, similar thing. And the thing that's really wild is if we get this dat core API in there and the ability to replicate through the pure sockets, you could actually reproduce basically the entirety of the dat stack within a web application. Um, which means that you could re-implement HyperDB totally in the user land and do discovery inside a user land and do your replication and now you have total user extensibility of the DAT stack. Uh, and that, I think, would be pretty hot. Some of the things I've been thinking about lately. I bet our build is done. It's done! All right, the final moment of truth. Don't breathe. Okay, it's taking too long. I can't hold my breath for this whole wait. Oh, nice. Got it. Bug fixed. I need like a soundboard for these streams so I can play something triumphant when that happens. Okay. So now I just need to remove all this debugging instrumentation in here. Yeah, right. What I really need is a DJ. Alright, let's take a look at the diff. Okay. Okay, well, the good news is we finished the bug. The bad news is I think that means it's time for the live stream to come to a close. It took it 45 minutes longer than usual, which I uh, hope that's cool with everybody. I've typically in the past have kept it kind of tightly constrained to an hour, but I don't know. I feel like if y'all are hanging out, then you know, keep going as long as I feel like it. But I think I'm done for now. So as always, thank y'all so much for coming. We'll do this again next week. As always, you can find me on Twitter, you find me on GitHub, IRC, and email, so feel free to reach out, and uh, have a good rest of your weekend. So, uh, see you all around.